Hey, welcome to this year's workshop presented by Form Factor Incorporated. My name is Craig Kirkpatrick. My colleague Gavin Fisher and I are going to present this material to you together. I'll begin with the, oh, maybe the first 30 minutes worth of slides and then hand it over to Gavin for the bulk of the presentation. So let's uh, dive right in. Well, one thing I found useful um, is to remind people about um, Cascade Microtech. Uh, Cascade Microtech has existed in this uh, business of microprobing and probe stations um, since the middle 1980s. Um, and we were acquired by Form Factor in 2016. We operate now under the Form Factor name. So if you're used to um, trying to track down Cascade Microtech. We're still around, same folks making the same great products, um, just part of a larger umbrella that's focused on the same marketplace. Okay. Oh, a um, bit more about um, Form Factor Incorporated. It's a good sized corporation, roughly 1,500 um, global employees at both some factories and also many, many field locations, supporting all of our customers worldwide. So it's a wonderful team. All right, a bit of background, um, who we are, what we do, uh, at least for this particular presentation, which is not focused on probe cards for mass production, but more on device characterization. Um, what we see as ourselves is being the the interface between the device under test, which is a wafer, in this case, uh, someone's holding a 300 millimeter wafer, and typically a vector network analyzer. Um, why do people, why do our customers um, go through the effort and challenge of making these measurements on wafer? Well, ultimately it's to get the best device measurements possible and to ultimately save money. Um, imagine in a smartphone that you're carrying, how many unique integrated circuits there are. And if they all were not tested until final test of the handset, um, the turn on rate or scrap rate for the uh, handsets would be unacceptable. And so it becomes essential to make good measurements and be able to bin known good die. So that, that's the value space we have as we save our customers money. Okay, so just a kind of the lay of the land. Uh, this, this is a picture of one of our summit probe stations on a vibration table. And basically everything we call out in that um, bluish color, you know, RF probes, calibration standards, which we call ISSs, calibration software, which we'll talk about shortly, the mechanics of the probe station positioners, the probe station itself, and even RF cables are, are things that we sell. And then we have business partners that make the various instrumentation, whether it be uh, SMUs or power supplies and vector network analyzers. Um, so just a little bit of a detailed look at um, something with the, the Summit 12K station. Um, it's a semi-automatic probe station. And what that means is you have essentially an operator doing manual loading of a wafer on to the chuck. Um, it, but at that point, the rest of the operation of the station can be um, automated, or essentially what it is is the chuck is, is roboticized. It can move in all dimensions, X, Y, Z, and even rotate, uh, we call it theta. Um, and the um, stations typically have a thermal capability. We also do make um, stations where um, instead of uh, you know manually loading a wafer, you can have a boat of wafers and an auto loader. But uh, quite commonly, these analytic probe stations are like you see right here. Okay, so RF probes. Um, as I mentioned, Cascade Microtech has <laughs> um, existed um, since the middle 1980s, and the innovation beginning maybe in 1983 was making a high bandwidth microprobe to 
take the transition from a coaxial cable, which connects to the instrument, and be able to make a high integrity contact on something that's essentially flat. So that, that's really what our, one of our strengths at Form Factor is this uh, ability to make a clean transition um, that optimizes um, RF performance, you know, basically the optimal insertion loss and return loss characteristics. Okay. Um, RF probing is a multifaceted challenge, as you can imagine. And, um, you know, each of these forces um, play play sometimes against each other. Um, so it's a, it's, it's a good challenge for all of us. Okay, a quick look at um, our, our RF probe families. Um, there's the T-Wave probe, which we um, resell. Uh, it's something we don't manufacture ourselves, but it's a probe family that I'll talk about in the next slide, or a later slide, um, that allows us to, at this point in time, go up to uh, above terahertz frequency. Um, if you look at the infinity probe, um, grouping there there's <clears throat> coaxial probes but we also make uh, waveguide probes for infinity and i'll have a slide that talks about the offering that we have there one of our very first um rf probes that we made going back to the 1980s was a probe we call the air coplanar probe or the acp probe and i've got a slide or two that talk about that it's a you know it's a, a probe that's from its technology it's how many years old um, 35 years old, but it still has some interesting characteristics. Some people like it, and um, we keep selling them, so we still keep offering them. In 2010, uh, what was then Cascade Microtech um, merged with Seuss Microtech, and Seuss um, was a reseller of the Rosenberger Z Probe family, and we kept that relationship, so we still are a reseller of the Z Probe. And I'll talk briefly about the Z probe as well. Going back to the Infinity probe, we also have a rather new version, um, kind of a subfamily of the Infinity probe called the Infinity Plus, that we introduced. Um, we introduced it at IMS a year ago. All right. So briefly about the air coplanar probe. The ACP probe has a probe tip structure with independent fingers, if you want to call them that. And you see that in the photograph that shows, uh, you know, three three fingers pointing north, if you want to call it that. Um, so that would be typically a ground signal, ground. Um, and we have that basically planar transition as a metal coplanar waveguide tip that's attached to a micro coax that. Um, then has some mechanical supports in the probe body, eventually getting up to the RF connector. Um, they've got you know good characteristics, handle a lot of current, um, handle good uh, temperature range, and um, there's this you know maybe the fourth or fifth bullet it says 25 micron compliance. What we mean by compliance is sort of individual springiness of the probe tips. So if something that we're probing is not completely planar the probe tips can adapt to it or they can comply to it. So that's why we say compliance. Here we see the Infinity probe. Um, it's a probe that we introduced in the year 2000. It has really our best electrical performance, um, certainly better than the Airco planar probe, and I'll talk more about that in a later slide. Part of that is the transition from the micro coax to the probe tips is handled in a essentially a little um, circuit that you know it's it's like a PCB but it's a thin film circuit um, on polyimid. It's the same sort of technology that we use in our probe cards that are our pyramid probe card um, family. Um, so it has really good performance, and we'll see in a later slide some of the reasons why the um, electrical performance is superior. Well, here it is. So the, the picture at the top shows the electromagnetic fields between, say, the three fingers, like a ground signal ground, of the airco planar probe versus 
the microstrip technology um, that's in the infinity probe tip, the fields are more contained. So what this really means is when you get right up to the, the point of probing the device under test, there's less chance of the electromagnetic fields um, of, of the signal and the probe interacting with the surface of the wafer itself. Um, and so this becomes, you know, I'll say uh, noticeable and important probably over 20 gigahertz. Infinity also excels at being able to probe small pads. It has very small probe marks. The, uh, the picture that's in the bottom center shows some successive probe marks at various degrees of over travel. So you can see that you can make good solid contact with minimum over travel and essentially minimum probe skate. So that, that allows you to make contact on small pads without skating off the pad. In the Infinity family, we have waveguide probes that we manufacture in our Beaverton operation, Beaverton, Oregon. Um, we have families going up to the, well, we'll call it the 325 gigahertz band. There's optional um, bias T, you know, for providing a DC bias to the device under test. So it's quite a nice uh, probe family, and we've had these for quite a while. As I mentioned earlier, um, we have a channel partner and we resell their probes. We call that the T wave probe. It helps us reach into the terahertz frequency range. And the, um, the T wave probes also have really good RF characteristics. So if you look at the plot here, it's showing an insertion loss comparison between what is in blue, which is our infinity probe versus a T wave probe. And you can see that you've got, you know, depending on the frequency you're looking at, between one or one and a half dB better insertion loss with the T-Wave probe. So there's lots of uh, nice advantages with the T-Wave probe. And as I said, um, the Infinity probes, we don't make above 325 gigahertz. We have T-Wave probes going above one terahertz. So lots of capability. So here's a little bit more about the T-Wave. You can see um, one aspect is it's able to probe on very small pads. Um, it also has an optional integrated DC bias network. Um, the probe tip itself is a replaceable structure. So essentially there's kind of a built-in repairability in the probe design. Um, and then, yeah, lots of great characteristics. Um, I talked about the Rosenberger Z probe. The Z probe is something that many customers like because um, they find it has a long lifetime for, I'll call it like low volume manufacturing. Um, it has good high, high RF power handling. Like the ACP probe, it has good compliance, you know, basically individual um, probe tips that have their own little springiness to them. Um, some people say that they like the, uh, the ability to control the force of contact with the over travel. The, uh, the angle of approach of the probe tips is quite a bit steeper. So with the given over travel, um, the force ramps rather, rather quickly. So that's sometimes good, sometimes bad. It depends on whether you like it or not. Okay, so now a bit about RF calibration and our calibration software that we call WinCal XE. So um, briefly, WinCal XE is software that runs on a PC and it's able to remote control a vector network analyzer. And what it does is it, instead of automating the calibration that's built into the vector network analyzer, we actually automate the raw, uh, raw measurements of the calibration standards and we compute the calibration error set within WinCal and we download the correction to the to the instrument. So really, uh, it's a broad, ca broadly capable RF calibration tool. And we'll talk quite a bit about the various calibration types that are available um, within WinCal. Well, there's this quick slide right here, um, and there's a you know you see the pull down menu, quite a list of different types of calibrations, and we're going to touch on 
many of these in the coming slides and then talk about, you know, if one is better than another. Well, first, um, why calibrate? <laughs> well, of course, what you want to achieve is the best measurements possible of your device under test. And there are systematic errors that are within the vector network analyzer itself, the cabling leading up to the probes, um, any sort of mismatch or reflections in the probe itself. And what you really want to do is be able to move your measurement reference plane so that you're just looking at your device under test itself. That's the objective. Well, um, talking about the various calibration types, there's this very ubiquitous calibration type, short, open, load, and through. It's, it's basically available on every vector network analyzer platform. We also have it within WinCal. Um, I'll end up showing you uh, a few comparisons um, of SOLT versus some other calibration types and help you understand SOLT's limitations relative to some of the more advanced calibrations that we have available. Okay, so <laughs> one funny aspect um, of SOLT calibration is when you finish an SOLT calibration, um, it's really difficult to know how good the SOLT calibration is. Um, people are tempted to just simply go back and remeasure calibration standards. Um, the problem with that is that's not really valid because say you go back and remeasure um, a load, but somehow you describe the, uh, the cal coefficients for the load incorrectly. Um, what will happen is the uh, the remeasurement will just simply show what the calibration coefficient predicted it should look like. So what you end up needing is independent um, standards to touch down upon. So instead of remeasuring re the short or the open or the load or the through, typically what's done is, is measuring maybe like an offset open or an offset short, um, just some other independent device. Uh, um, and we have verification lines that are on our impedance standard substrates just for this purpose so that you can have um, a good way of evaluating the quality of an SOLT calibration. And I do have some slides that show this uh, coming up in a bit. Actually, right there. Um, <laughs> so what we're seeing here is on the left, one of our highest integrity calibration types, and we'll talk about it more later, but it's the LRRM calibration looking at an offset open. Um, on a Smith chart, you have this progression of phase over frequency. And because there's some loss over the length, in this case, a 40 picosecond length uh, open stub, um, it spirals in toward the middle of the Smith chart. And ideally, this sort of thumbprint, if you want to call it that, should be, um, you know, like, like you see on the left, you know, well-centered lines don't cross each other. There's no little curly cues. And what we see on the right with SOLT, is it doesn't look too bad, honestly. It's just not, not perfectly centered. And so what this is indicating is um, that something like the cal coefficients were not ideally describing, say, like the open capacitance or the short inductance or the load inductance. Um, like I said, not really a bad... Uh, a bad looking offset open, um, but still not as perfect as what you see on the left. Then something else that you end up noticing is it typically starts to become noticeable above 20 gigahertz, but you see a little bit of, um, well, it says here, fine grain ripple um, in measurements uh, as an artifact of SOLT. And what it comes down to is there are Sources of error that are within the VNA, um, essentially sw switch error terms, if you want to call it that, that are not part of the um, the correction done by SOLT. So you end up inheriting some uncorrectable errors with SOLT, and they show up as what you see here. Okay, so moving right along, um, the SOLR, or short open load reciprocal through calibration, is, is quite a handy tool. It's handy in that um, there are cases when you might have 
quite easily obtainable, what I call reflect standards, the short open load. But then maybe for whatever reason, you don't have a good access to a, a through, either a through that exists at all, or a through that can be described well. You know, so um, when we have a through on one of our impedance standard substrates, it might be with probes nearly nose to nose, and the, the through is one picosecond long, and there's a model for its loss over frequency. But but sometimes the, the, the through that you've got available just is not that ideal at all, or maybe the only through you've got available is the, the device under test itself. And so that's one of the really wonderful things about this short open load reciprocal through calibration is you don't have to have any prior knowledge or any model of what the through is. And so it, it can end up tolerating lossy or highly reactive um, through standards. And I'll show you some other um, examples like with, with a right angle through um, and how, how well it behaves. All right, so um, on the uh, the Keysight PNAs, um, they won't call it SOLR; they'll call it um, unknown through. So unknown through and short open load reciprocal through or SOLR are all synonymous. Um, so yeah, WinCal supports this. Uh, wonderful thing is you don't have to have any definition of the through. It's recommended for um, dual signal probes, like a ground signal, ground signal, ground probe, or for right angle. Um, well, it says right angle probes. What it really is saying is a right angle device under test where you have maybe RF ports like on the west and the south. Um, and in that case, your, your through has got an angle in it. <laughs> um, and we'll, that's where I've, I mentioned I've got a slide that illustrates that. Also in the case of... Um, probe cards, um, you know, where you don't really have much opportunity to make an ideal um, calibration standard all of the time, you can apply uh, SOLR if the through is not very well described or well known. All right, so here's this example um, of a right angle through, and again, this would be an example of touching down like a ground signal ground probe in the west and one in the south, and there really is a, uh, a kink in the um, RF performance. And you, you would see that and it shows up here right around, what was it, like 21 gigahertz. There's a little bit of a, a little bit less than a half a dB dip in S21. So that's real. It really exists. Um, well, if you um, had no choice and you just used SOLT and then you go remeasure the through, Essentially, it'll mislead you and you'll get the flat line that's there in either the blue or the aqua color. And so it's not really showing you the truth of what's really existing. Um, versus you use SOLR, there's no prior knowledge of what that through should look like. So you can go back and remeasure it and see what it really does behave like. So there's that other, you know, it's another advantage, let's just say, of, uh, of SOLR. Okay. Moving right along here. Okay, so yeah, this is a similar calibration comparison between LRRM on the left, so basically finishing the calibration and then measuring one of these offset opens. Um, and you see that basically the SOLR looks very similar, uh, you know, on the right to what we saw with the um, SOLT. And it still gets back to the Cal coefficients probably are not perfectly defined. Um, we'll end up talking a bit later about how LRM gets away with this. Um, so essentially, it doesn't need Cal coefficients at all. So that's kind of cool. All right. Um, TRL, uh, which stands for through reflect line, it's a, a calibration type that in some respects needs the, the least prior knowledge about the calibration standards. Um, so the, the reflex don't need to have any Cal coefficients. The, the through and the line are basically both, um, like throughs, they're both transmission lines. Um, typically depending on whether you're doing some broadband frequency work, you may need multiple lines in order to cover all of the frequencies that you're intending to cover. If you're doing 
you know, some banded work with waveguide probes. You might be able to get away with just a single um, uh, one of the, the lines. Um, versus if you're trying to do something, say, some, you know, maybe like from 6 gigahertz to 60 gigahertz, it would probably require, you know, three or four lines. And, and sometimes they get them impractically long. Um, so it's not really the most convenient calibration type. Um, it, it's not uh, not in any way convenient, I would say. But we, we support it within one cal. Um, so w when do people choose TRL? Well, on way for microstrip embedded devices um, is one example. Certainly in frequencies above maybe 200 gigahertz, probably the best choice entirely. Um, there's one adva advantage is when you finish the calibration, the measurement reference plane is left at the middle of the through. So effectively it's de-embedded the probe tip to pads um, and you're, you've put your reference uh, offset from the probe tips at the center of the through. That's kind of handy. Um, okay, well, this isn't, uh, you know, like a the previous Smith charts where we had a nice comparison left and right. I wish I wish I had a slide like that. But basically, it's just kind of showing the calibration quality and what to expect with TRL. It looks quite good. Um, Multi-line TRL it was a variation on what you might call vanilla TRL. Um, it was created by Roger Marks at the National Institute of Standards and Technology in the United States. Um, and it basically takes some of the shortcomings of the original TRL and makes significant improvements. Um, you know, one of them is, yeah, I mentioned the case of maybe if you're trying to do 6 gigahertz to 60 gigahertz and having to do multiple um, lines. Um, well, they, they, each one of those lines then helps cover different frequency ranges, and you'd end up with what you'd call like a band break, where if you looked at data, you'd see where uh, in the data where it would hop from one of the one of the uh, the lines to the other line, essentially in the, the different bands. Um, and so that you know is always disconcerting when you see that in your data. And so one of the greatest improvements with the multi-line TRL is it um, removes that issue entirely. So quite quite nice. And WinCal is one of the very few commercial available implementations of multi-line TRL. Okay, um, this is a quick view of some of the windows and the setup for WinCal's multi-line TRL. I don't want to spend too much time on this because I've got quite a lot of slides and I want to keep this presentation, or at least my portion of it, rather rather brief. Um, leave more time for Gavin Fisher. All right, so um, I'll say my favorite calibration type, LRRM. Well, wh why is it my favorite? <laughs> um, the, the most wonderful thing about line reflect reflect match, our unique um, calibration that we have only available in WinCal XE, is it doesn't need to have um, any knowledge of cal coefficients. There are a few, let's just say, things that need to be known. You need to have a good model of the through, so length and loss of the through. There is a requirement that the reflex be equal. So if you are touching down on shorts or opens, um, effectively the probes have to be identical, you know, same pitch, um, same model of the probe, um, because we're expecting equal opens and equal shorts on the two probes for a two-port calibration. Um, the other th part is, you know, like I said, not needing cal coefficients for the short and the open. We also don't need to know the cal coefficient, which is usually a load inductance for the load. Um, that's automatically determined in the algorithm and the calibration. So effectively, all we really need to know up front, assuming, you know, the probes are identical, um, is the characteristic of the through line. If you think about it, that's one of the advantages of TRL was having so little prior knowledge of CAL standards um, required up front. Well, LRM is many, many times more convenient to use um, than TRL. Um, and it uh, has some of the same nice characteristics in that there's no prior knowledge of 
Cal standards required. So it, it really solves a lot of problems. It's quite nice. So this is a bit of uh, understanding of just how well L excuse me, how well LRRM works. So with one of our infinity probes out to 110 gigahertz, um, if we go and we remeasure um, the open, what you see there is that little, it kind of looks like a little noisy green line, but if you look at the scale, it's well within like, um, you know, maybe it dips down to 0 0.03 dB. I mean, that, that's really, really good across that frequency range to have it be, you know, well within even 0.1 dB. So that's really a spectacular performance um, for both the probe and the, um, and the calibration math. Here's another one, um, one of the, the ways we have within WinCal where we um, somewhat automatically by default, we, we run a calibration validation at the end of a Cal. And so again, across 110 gigahertz, what this is doing is it's comparing the uh, percent S parameter difference between what was predicted by the Cal coefficient, which we don't actually use with LRM, and what the actual measurement was. So it's basically saying, you know, how well did we fit what we thought was the Cal coefficient that we shipped with the probe? Um, and so that this is a you know good quick way to spot really gross errors. Um, one of the funny things is I talked about this with SOLT. If you run SOLT calibration and you go to this exact same plot, um, there is no difference because it doesn't have a way to know what the difference is. Um, so another nice thing about LRM. Okay, so which is best? Well, we're a bit, I'll say agnostic, but I really, I think you've heard from me that LRRM is best. LRRM is not um, always available. Um, so LRRM wouldn't be available if you had two probes, maybe east and west, but they were different probe configurations. Like maybe one was ground signal ground and one was ground signal, or maybe either two probes or just different pitches. Um, you know, LRRM needs the probes to be uh, equal because it's expecting equal reflex, you know, equal shorts, equal opens at the scene at the two probe tips. Um, so that's one example where you might not be able to use LRRM, in which case you have to fall back to SOLT. Um, SOLR is a really great problem solver. Um, you saw that when we looked at um, the ability to use right angle throughs. Um, and, and just other applications where there just is not a really good model describing what the characteristics are of a through that you have available. All right, so uh, LRRM, really the best um, uh, calibration we've got available. There's a note here that says assumptions start to break down badly above 500 gigahertz can give reliable results up to maybe 220 gigahertz. And that's what I would say is in the, the waveguide uh, banded regions, it's actually convenient um, to do TRL calibration because you don't have multiple lines that you have to touch down upon um, versus broadband lower frequency TRL. I, it's just really um, challenging to do something below 100 gigahertz and broadband and use TRL. Um, but TRL has its place um, like we talked about before. Okay, so um, we talked about our probes. We talked about the calibration software. Well, the last little bit is, you know, what, what do our short open loads and throughs look like? Well, they're on a little alumina ceramic substrate. Um, there's basically a pattern metal with a gold uh, layer on it for making good probe marks, essentially. And what you see is multiple repetitions of throughs, shorts, loads. Um, in this example, the open is probes in the air. The bottom, those are look like really different lengths of throughs. You can play with TRL with those, but they're really there for having um, um, on like an offset open uh, um, verification structure. So we, we really think of them as verification structures. Some people assume that they're really TRL lines. And like I said, they can be used for that, but not really, um, not really the, the, what the original purpose was for those. Um, 
another little item here is um, absorbing ISS holder. Well, what we can find is that maybe above 50 gigahertz, we can start to see some um, effects where basically fields are interacting um, beyond the ISS. So if we put the ISS on top of the little microwave absorber, um, it gives us more predictable results or results that follow what the prediction would be. Like you can, if you look at this in, in green, this is where above 50 gigahertz in green kind of follows what you would expect. Um, in red, it starts to flatten out, which doesn't make sense really. You expect higher loss at higher frequency. Um, some of our probe stations uh, have the ISS holder itself um, be out of the same material, so you don't need it as a, as a separate little separate little puck. Okay, so then just a few slides to wrap up my section. Um, design considerations for the device under test. Well, I, I mentioned before that the air coplanar probes can handle um, up to 25 micron of lack of planarity of the device under test. The infinity probes are expecting things to be coplanar, or excuse me, just planar rather, within a bit better than a micron. Um, so infinity's got really good uh, electrical characteristics, but you could argue that its mechanical characteristics aren't quite as um, quite as friendly. Um, whenever possible. Um, have your device laid out as ground signal ground. Um, basically, ground signal ground probes behave at higher frequencies. Let's just say two and a half times better than a ground signal or a signal ground probe. So having a GSG arrangement is um, surprisingly important. There's a th some thumb rules here that show what we would expect to be the highest calibratable usable frequency based on the pitch of the probe. So you can say, you know, one fiftieth of a wavelength um, for the highest frequency for uh, ground signal, you know, based on the, the pitch that you've got, like say if you have a ground signal 500 micron probe, um, then you can calculate what the, you know, maximum recommended frequency would be. Um, it's convenient if you have a choice when you're laying out your device, Maybe if you keep your um, RFs in the east and west, and then the the powers and control signals in the north and the south. But you know you don't always have control of this, but uh, it's just convenient for these probes that have to come in um, in their quadrants, you know, in north, south, east, and west quadrants. Um, briefly, um, there is an opportunity, um, say for device characterization in this case of a uh, of a FET. Um, to also remove the probe to pad parasitics so that you really get back to the transistor itself. And there's utilities built into WinCal where if you've got structures that you can measure for opens and short, then we can do uh, pad parasitic removal. And there's an example here. So it's nice that this function is uh, built into WinCal. Okay. Well, at this point, this is where I end, and I'll hand it over to my colleague, Gavin Fisher. Thanks, Craig. That was great. So in my half of the presentation, we're going to talk about uh, some metrics to understand the performance of systems and you know why we do that. Uh, I'm going to talk about some enhancements for uh, millimeter wave measurements, both in waveguide and coaxial, and then on to some thermal. Uh, and hopefully in the process of this, we can give some hints and tips on things that can uh, be done to improve the general measurement performance. Um, so um, why did we get into the metrics? I mean, metrics should have always been important, but um, they came more important when we uh, entered into uh, a joint uh, project with Keysight Technologies in order to provide wafer level measurement solutions. Uh, the idea behind all of this is that we would have um, systems which are tailored to leverage the benefits 
of their instrumentations and likewise their instrumentation would leverage the benefits of our stations and when we went into to do these what we wanted is some some guarantees that we could give to customers so they would understand uh, what they were getting one of them is a guaranteed configuration so if anything's wrong we've misconfigured it it's it's our dollar it's pretty clear. Um, guaranteed integration meant that we could go into a customer site and we have a controlled method of installing it and understanding that it's working in general. Um, we'd have guaranteed support so uh, you wouldn't be chasing around trying to find someone who's going to help you. Uh, there'd be a single point of contact which would be uh, typically form factor. Uh, and at, and last but not least which is the reasoning behind all this presentation is the guaranteed performance this is an optional thing now uh, but essentially we provide the customer with a series of metrics which we can test the system against and these are hard metrics so because if it doesn't uh, pass they have the option of sending the machine back so they uh, they are it's important that we we know correctly uh, how the machine performs uh, when we first did this uh, back in, uh, I think it was 2014, uh, we went through a, a great big long set of tests. Essentially, we had uh, 50 gigahertz, we had 110 gigahertz, and I think we had 26 and a half gigahertz as well. And we did it on uh, the main stations we had at the time, which was, you know, the Summit 12K and the Elite. Uh, we've since broadened that out uh, to, you know, CM300. Uh, testing, and we've done some on the Summit 200 as well. But the idea is that we basically have uh, a series of tests that we know to to know that the system is working correctly. So uh, we'll talk about uh, these in more detail in the next slides. Um, <clears throat> essentially, um, we, when we go to a customer site and when we are discussing what they're going to get, we will provide them with a series of metrics like these. And these metrics are basically, uh, we have... Um, some what we call accuracy metrics, which are when we, we physically measure some standards and we look for the repeatability of the measurement on those standards. So we measure lines and stubs. Um, we also look at repeatability of calibration. So we do 20 calibrations if it's uh, uh, um, non-thermal, uh, 10 if it's thermal, or actually five if it's thermal. Um, and we would uh, basically do those calibrations and we would compare the open response. And we'd also look at the um, calibration uh, delta of the error sets. We'll talk more about that in a minute. So these were system these were measurements to understand uh, how much calibrations vary uh, and then we have uh, some drift performance to understand how much the system is going to drift and we had metrics uh, which the customer can look at for all of these so um Calibration repeatability. So one of the nice means you have of calibration repeatability is to, under, is to look at the error set. If you had a perfectly stable system uh, and it would give you exactly the same error set absolutely every single time. Obviously, this isn't true. You don't get that. Um, but that's the idea. So how, how do you store uh, your error sets? Well, one way is to actually copy the error set themselves, and you can do that, and we frequently do. The other way, which is also very useful for traceability of your own benefit, is to record the calibration file, WCF. If you do so, then you have access to all of the uh, raw measurements that made up the cow and all the settings. So it's a very good thing, and I, I encourage customers all the time to take this copy of this file, and that's what we were doing as part of um, the uh, metric the, uh, that we were doing. Essentially, when we were doing this uh, repeatability test, what we would do is we'd set everything up uh, and then we'd let the system automatically redo 20 sets of calibrations on the same spot. Uh, and then we'd look at the repeatability of the open and we'd look at the repeatability of the error terms that we would get from this. We did this work um, using um, a little piece of software that we wrote in .NET. It uses uh, WinCal remoting in order to do this, which is a means of remotely controlling WinCal. And so this was just a nice, simple setup. So this is giving you a little snippet of, of the code. Um, essentially, it's really, really nice and easy. I'm no programmer, uh, but I found it fairly straightforward to uh, program in Visual Basic uh, inside Visual Studio because you had access to all the methods associated with WinCal remoting and this makes the coding uh, pretty straightforward. So now let's go into one of the first uh, practical examples using WinCal uh, as a repeatability comparison to tool. Uh, the idea is that we're going to use WinCal to compare error sets uh, to see how much uh, the worst case SIJ error varies with respect to the nth one with respect to the first one and likewise how much variation there is on an open measurement both all of which come from 
um, LRM based calibrations as part of our repeatability tests. So I'm just going to come out of uh, PowerPoint. And you can see that we have the Velux scripting console and WinColec C running. Um, we don't need to use scripting console, but uh, we I use this uh, just because it's there as part of this normal Velux. So um, let's look at error set comparison, which I got to from tools error set comparison. At the moment, if you look at my error set manager, I've got no error sets to compare, and I want to basically provide WinCal with the error sets that came from another machine. And uh, one problem I have is if I, I can add these from disk, but I can't, can't add more than one at the same time. If I press Shift, I, I can't do them. That's what I'd like to do. Um, so let's, let's do this another way. So I'm just going to shut down WinCal. And I'm going to open uh, the location where my error sets are. I've got 20 of those. I'm going to copy them. And I'm going to deposit them here, which is where uh, WinCal by default will store its error sets. Now, the trouble we have is those error sets won't be seen directly in WinCal, they have to be referenced. Uh, inside uh, this list here, which uh, is the Cal set MGR list. Uh, so at the moment, there's there's nothing there's nothing in that list. So we need to populate it. So for that, I'm going to use uh, Python for this, and essentially, I'm going to point to um, the lo that uh, location we were before. I'm going to take a copy of the uh, CalSet MGR list, uh, and I'm going to also point to the WinCal folder where the error sets are located. I'm going to go through that list sequentially, and I'm going to add the names of the folders to uh, the um, CalSet MGR list. That will allow WinCal to see it in this list of error sets. So let's let's just run that. So that's them all added. Um, the numbering sequence of the of the walk is a little bit strange, but no matter. So that's fire at WinCal. And if I go to Tools, um, Error Set Manager, you can see I've got some error sets in there. And if I want to, you know, I can do I can do a comparison uh, between two error sets. And then if I wanted to, I could, you know, view the data items and I could extract the max error case. And I could just basically get these. And I can, you know, sequentially put those in a file. Uh, let's just... and I can I can look at that let's, uh, let's look at uh, x y of magnitude, and so I've got that magnitude and that's fine. But um, I can do a little bit of processing on that, but that's a pain because I have to do that multiple times, twenty times. I don't want to do that twenty times. It's it's inconvenient. So let's let's go for another approach. Um, so what I'm going to do um, is I'm going to come out of that. And I'm going to open uh, this thing, which is basically my, I have an empty uh, report. So inside this empty report, I'm going to populate it with the error sets I've just uh, created. So not created, imported. So we've 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 imported those. Now, what this uh, report does is, um, in the background, what it's going to do is it's going to uh, look at error set one. So error set one is E band one. So that's one that everything's going to be compared to E band one, and it's going to also look for an error set which is going to vary. And that variance is done by uh, this concatenation. So we have the string e band, and we have this thing which is number. 
Now, number comes from up here. So if we do customize toolbar, you'll see that we have this text box called number, which is a string. And I am able uh, with uh, the scratch pad to import that. So I'm getting that string and I'm putting it into an item called number, sorry, a, a variable called number. And I can use that as the method of changing the name of the error set I want to process. So for instance, if I looked at this, we're only seeing one respect to one, so there is no difference. But if I didn't want to see one with respect to two, I'll go in there and I process one, one with respect to two. Uh, if I wanted to, I could, you know, let's cancel that. I can get rid of that if I just put like a hundred, say, no, nothing will process right now, okay? Because there is no hundred, it will just generate an error, but it's quite a benign one. I can get rid of those things. And now what I'm going to do um, is I want to do all 20. Uh, and I'm going to do that um, using a sequence. So uh, if I look at tools, sequences, I have a, a sequence under miscellaneous called count up. And all count up does is basically um, it points to, uh, we have a count, string copy two, we have a loop. And basically what we're going to do is a save string, and we're going to save that into number, which is inside this report, and we're just going to iterate away. This thing is called a count up, and on the toolbar we have this button which is iterate, and that points to that sequence called count up. So if I then press this, uh, iterate, I'll then get basically one by one the um, the differences given to me and what I'm doing here is I'm filtering uh, that out so I'm filtering it using trace group properties by filtering only looking for max and you can see only the maxes are, are shown which is the max delta but I could I could filter it any any way I wanted uh, from that so that's that's all fine and well now Let's consider the case that perhaps uh, we didn't have the error sets handy. We maybe just had the WCF file. So the WCF file in WinCal is a file where we have all the data related to a particular cal. So if I open a particular cal file, I can say open this one. And I can see, okay, you know, here's what the raw look like for, for that through. Oh, and I can then... I can compute and create new new um, error terms, and I could go through one by one. In the past, that's that's what I did, but instead we're going to dynamically open the WCFs one by one and compute them one by one, all remotely. Uh, one thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to do uh, let's get rid of that for a minute. I'm going to do tools um, error set manager. Let me just delete everything. Yeah. Uh, just to prove we're not cheating. So, and uh, what I'm going to do um, is I'm going to go to the options and I'm going to see any new error set is going to get uh, that name, percent uh, %n, which is uh, a unique number, which will be which will be incremented. So, and uh, I've already got that set to one. And you can you can reset that number in in the background. There is uh, hiding in a file. Um, so, uh, if we Let's just close the sequence manager. We can close that. Oh, we could we could see that maybe move as well. Till if we go to error set manager, you can see it's it's blank uh, at the moment. Um, so let's open this other script. So this other script basically is going to point to the location uh, where my WCF files are, um, and that's basically in this repeatability folder. Uh, and it's going to make a connection to WinCal. I'm doing this. Uh, using WinCal remotely, WinCal remoting. I've already got WinCal remoting installed on here. Uh, and when I run this, it's going to make the communication WinCal. It's got a command that says, "Hey WinCal, open this uh, WCF file, and then compute the error terms." And the naming scheme comes from uh, basically from from this guy here. So uh, let's run that one. It's our communication wing cal established. We can see we're going through and creating those error terms one by one, one through twenty. 
and having done that I can then do the same thing kind of in reverse I could uh, if I wanted to for, for whatever reason I could then go to you know the Winkel Erisets folder and you can see it's 1254 it's just been made brand new just just right now and then we could use that for export purposes the only reason that you might not want to do this approach is that would mean that we had two sets of computes on the LRM which might slightly change the load inductance but it's normally it's doesn't really change at all okay one last thing let's show the uh, ability to compare open measurements so let's look at that um, let's look at this uh, I think it's this one and essentially all that's going on here is we've got a bunch of data items we have our open measurements that were taken of uh, eBand uh, and this is the straight, you know, open raw performance. Sorry, the the straight uh, measurement, corrected measurement, and it's got gain. The gain is expected because the cow was measured with the uh, open on the substrate. Uh, I expect that. But what I'm going to look into more is the variation. I'm doing this by looking at uh, basically a percent difference, which is cal calculating the EVM, the error vector magnitude, and dividing it by uh, the original vector. Uh, if I um, right click I can view the trace group properties and I can see that it's using the percentage difference function and I'm comparing to the first uh, trace as my base. I can uh, have a look at that uh, limit line by looking at the trace properties for that and you can see it's a limit line and it's got a limit of 1%. So using this tool we get a, a good, good uh, metric to see what the open variation is on the system and uh, get good performance info. So with regard to um, accuracy, uh, what we mean for, for accuracy is we look at repeatability of a measurement of a standard and the standard that we use for that is the uh, long transmission line, the 40, 40 picosecond lines that we have on the bottom of the ISS. We look at it both as a line uh, and as a stub also. This gives you an overview of, of what we do, uh, but essentially it's it's in line with the repeatability measurements, though this time, rather than just letting the system automatically recal, what we would do is we would you know align uh, the probes up, we would do the cal, then we would move the right-hand probe, take a measurement off the line, uh, and then we would basically do some Z movements on both probes to, to measure both stubs, uh, and then we would uh, rinse and repeat. With regard to uh, pro placement, it's really, really important. Uh, it's always important, but it's really important, especially when you're trying to put a signal, you know, a, a series of metricated measurements together. And uh, for this, uh, the EVU microscope uh, and the overlay markers that we have in Velix were pretty much essential for all of this work. We, uh, what I always tend to do is provide uh, markers that allow me to find the offset from the end of the standard and this is uh, very easy also if you've got a motorized microscope because then it will move almost perfectly to the end and you can make a, a last minute little tweak but that is really useful to get in your uh, pro positioning really tight. This just gives you um, a look at the uh, transmission characteristics and for these what we're doing is we're, this is uh, an error vector magnitude that uh, we basically multiply it to give us uh, a percentage um, and so these are uh, quite a tight spec uh, that, that we have in, uh, have in there for the line. Um, this just shows you um, the stubs and the stub measurements are typically uh, a lot a lot harder to do because it's a double the double the trip um, so this would always be the more challenging measurement to, uh, to do uh, in this graph uh, so in this uh, slide what we have is uh, an interesting little experiment that we did and in this experiment what we did was we uh, did the the stub measurement as you saw from before but what we did is then we uh, we took the third stub um, which is you know on port one uh, and port, so port one port two stub three and we which is the middle one of the set uh, and then we uh, uncorrected it using its error set uh, and then recorrected it in turn by error sets from cows one two three four and five so the only variable was the error set and not the measurement of the stub and as you can see the variation of measurement is much much less uh, indicating that the majority of the change that we saw wasn't the calibrations involved uh, but was the pro placement and the contact repeatability on the stub itself 
So another thing that we wanted to have uh, to uh, give customers a good idea of the performance of the system was a measurement of something, a physical standard which we have measured, whose characteristics we know. And uh, this was something, an independent standard was developed by Keysight. Um, and we basically have our engineers take this uh, wherever they go, and particularly if they can perform this um, for performance tests. Um, essentially, the, the model for how this is, you know, how we want this to be is that the it takes the place of the, you know, coaxial standards that you would have if you were checking out a, a VNA natively. Um, we would uh, the idea is to have a good coverage of the Smith chart with uh, standards that have uh, a good range of impedances and uh, standards with a, a high dynamic range to them. Uh, in particular, for high dynamic range, we'd use the BT standard, which is a deliberate 75 ohm mismatch, um, and it provides a very you know a very repeatable null point that we get here, and we use the characteristics of that to uh, give a good indication of the of the system performance. We also use transmission lines. Um, these transmission lines, we you can see the uh, normalized uncertainty over here. We use loads. These loads are dual trimmed, uh, as our ISSs are, and these are to within better than 23 dB return loss to 110 gigahertz. We also have uh, two a couple of shunts in there, and shorts and opens. Um, we have um, a series of metrics, so these are these are uh, published to the customer to tell them the limits at the various frequencies that we're going to be testing against. Um, so things like um, the you know the shorts, the opens, the lines, and, and the shunts uh, are all based on actual measurements of the individual standards. Um, the load is based on an absolute return loss, and the BT uh, basically is a series of measurements that we took to we averaged over all of them, and then th that is a, a generic uh, measurement. That null point is is very very repeatable. Um, in the field, we would um, get the we would understand you know we would test the customer unit um, using a piece of software called WaferPro Express. It's a test executive um, that's supplied by Keysight Technologies. Uh, and that can work in an automated fashion to run the test and provide the test metrics against it. So you can see, you know, um, here is our uh, line verification, and you can see the limits applied. Likewise, you can see uh, the BT standards, and these are, uh, as I say, the, the, the certainly the, the line standards, I think, uh, it's against individual serialized data. Um, so now with regard to drift measurements, um, <clears throat> when we do, um, so drift is really important. Uh, you don't want a system that's drifting because otherwise you're having to recalibrate a lot of the time. Uh, and a nice easy way of measuring drift is actually just to use the sequencing tool in WinCal. There'll be more about that in a bit, but it's built into WinCal natively. You don't need any external software to do this. And this will you know, automate that whole process uh, into the uh, WinCal measurement report. Um, so this gives you, you know, a measure of ambient drift, and you know, we were doing this in E-band, um, and it's really, really small uh, for these these waveguide measurements at low frequency. Um, we make sure that with the lab environment, it's typically, you know, plus minus one degree C when we do this, and we we measure the temperature uh, throughout. Ambient drift is pretty simple. Thermal drift is generally a lot harder. So let's talk about some of the improvements that have been made with regard to uh, high frequency optimization. So why is um, system stability important? So um, system stability is, is really important. Um, as I said before, you, you don't want to have uh, a system, you don't want to have your uh, very expensive uh, test cell uh, busy doing recalibrations all the time when you want to be doing measurements. Um, likewise, you don't want to uh, accept data that's good enough because that will be what will happen. You will say, oh, it's, it's maybe good enough. You want to get on and do your measurement. You, you don't want to avoid it. What you want to avoid is having the system instability in the first place. Um, ultimately, the reason why this diagram is here is this is just talking um, about uh, the, the concept of having a perfect reflectometer and these error boxes uh, in front of it that representing the state of the system. Uh, but this is a problem if the error box is not representative of the real life error. You'll you'll get um, erroneous measurements. Obviously, things that degrade it relate to you know losses in the system and sensitivity to environmental changes. 
speaking about uh, environmental changes, one a good one thing that you can do, which is in your grasp always, uh, to on these to improve things is to remove, sorry, is to reduce the losses that you will see. Example that we have here, uh, this is, you know, we get some description here from this nice key site uh, application note. Um, but essentially, the uh, loss that you inject uh, will typically degrade the directivity by around double uh, the insertion loss that, that you have. So it really is a lot of emphasis on, on removing that uh, or reducing that anyway. Um, as you can see, um, we have a T-Wave probe here. And the losses of this are, you know, are great. I mean, 2.9 dB. But if we look at, you know, the estimated, in fact, I think this is actual measured losses of this of this waveguide was 5.8 dB. So basically, the the loss of the uh, the loss of the guide is like double that of the probe. Um, so, you know, if you could do away of that, you'll get a, a significant improvement. Uh, in your directivity, and you'll also get improvement in your dynamic range, uh, which, okay, at lower frequency is not such a big deal, but at high frequency can start to become uh, more of an issue. So in the past, for coaxial work, uh, we would have systems that look like this. This was the uh, N5251A. It's, um, you know, the, you know, been in use for a number of years. Um, <clears throat> This system uh, used uh, uses 24 centimeter cables, which have a, a loss of around say 3.4 dB. Um, I mean, this system works perfectly fine, but you know the the actual inherent issues with it because there's you know we have these combiners here which are you know comparatively lossy. Uh, we have some 67 gigahertz cables which, albeit not very long, have losses associated with them. Uh, and of course, the lossy 24 centimeter cables. What tended to happen is it tended to, you know, could be, particularly if the, the room wasn't firmly stable, uh, tended to have uh, drift. So we make the measurement up to 110 and absolutely fine, but the uh, you could get drift from this. Uh, this was replaced by uh, uh, the N5291A, which is uh, this current unit from uh, Keysight, and I, I really love this. Um, it's so much more stable and so much more compact as well, and it allowed us to basically make a real improvement to the stations for coaxial work. And we had what we what I think is a fairly radical approach of uh, inclining these uh, at 45 degrees. So it enabled us to um, leverage as short a cable as, as we could get, but still have a proper top hat arrangement by which we, you know, dark and dry and have something which is, you know, fairly comparatively easy to set up and, and simple to use. So I think it's a, a nice combination. Um, and we use this same setup uh, on all our platforms, effectively. So we have this on, you know, the Summit 12K, Summit 200, CM300, Elites, uh, EPS 150s. We use more or less exactly the same setup, just with uh, different adaptations uh, for the height, which in the, even those are comparatively modest. Um, as part of uh, uh, this new new setup, we had a new top hat. Uh, the top hat is the uh, assembly which we use to um, basically enclose everything. Uh, we have these uh, patented um, uh, arrangement here. The, the, these uh, these uh, boots allow us to freely uh, move things around. And as you can see, you can see full access to your probes in there. Um, and if you want to make it dark, you can just put the metal cover across, and that's done in an instant. The uh, We have ITO loaded glass, so that's glass with a basic conductive coating. Uh, and that stops uh, a static charge build up inside. So this was a, a major advancement, and it's so handy when you're when you're setting things up. Um, this little snapshot just to gives you an idea of um, the difference in coaxial performance uh, that you get. So um, the okay, this is you know raw from the instrument, and it may not be totally representative, but gives you a, a reasonable guide. The green is from the uh, N5291A, and the blue is from the older N5251A. You can just see the huge difference in transmission loss. This is a measurement from uh, basically uh, a raw measurement port to port on the VNA where the probes are connected to a through. This is reflects. Uh, this is reflected in the improvement that you get in the drift of the system. On the left-hand side, you can see. You know, we got uh, the new system with 0.3% delta. On the right-hand side, we have uh, 0.87. And I've seen uh, over a longer period of time, it's uh, 
it's even more profound than that. This that new system, by the way, is capable of going up to 130 gigahertz, um, and we we you know we we do use that with convent you know these one millimeter cables, but they have a special uh, conductor. Sorry, they have a special uh, connector on there um, that does go pretty much all the way to 130 gigahertz. And we have tested the cables independently, and the cables were performing well, but we we're still seeing some issues. Um, uh, ultimately, we came to the conclusion that the problem was down in the probe, uh, and as such, we then swapped to using the I145 probe uh, with a 0.8 millimeter connector and use a 0.8 to uh, one millimeter adapter, and this greatly improved performance. We we are evaluating uh, cables with built-in adapters, and they should be coming soon. This just gives you an idea of uh, of the issues that we saw. You can see this very big notch at a uh, you know about 120 gigahertz, and this is this is basically uh, with without the adapters, the red one, and with the adapters in the blue. So it's a great improvement. And again, you can see this represented by the large improvement in the systemic drift. Note the change in scale. So on the left we have this. Uh, this is with the you know conventional cable. Uh, and on the right, uh, you have this uh, with the I-145 and the adapter. And note the change of scale. That's showing 200% delta. This is showing you like sub one. Uh, and this just shows you the nice measurement that we get of the line measurement uh, to 130 gigahertz. Now, to be fair, you would also see a measurement like this uh, even without the adapter, but like within seconds, you'll see a notch appear at this point here at 120. So as I said before, we've used this in a variety of stations. So you can see the implementation on the Summit 12K, and we've got that nice uh, rear shelf arrangement, which is all customized to get the cables all in all in the right place. And here it is on the EPS. And for, for just to be clear, all these set, all these setups we have, we can put uh, either four extenders on here, and we can also put four ports. So we can also have, you know, uh, sorry, uh, four. Uh, RF uh, probes on there, uh, but we at present don't have extenders in the uh, north and south locations, or not really uh, developed anything uh, none special uh, for, for these for that work. And here it is on the CM300, and again we have a custom shelf on the back uh, that allows the instrument to get nice and close uh, with, uh, with no issues. Though in fact, actually. This is very kind to us. The actual uh, umbilicals between the extender and the millimeter wave controller are, are very kind to us, and we have no issues supporting the uh, loader module. So uh, back to the land of waveguides. Uh, one thing to talk about here is to get an appreciation of um, the contribution of the waveguide to your overall measurement loss. Um, so if you look back here, you know at low frequencies, WR15. You know, we're looking at a comparatively small proportion of the overall loss, but this becomes very significant uh, when you're up at WR5 and WR3, especially if you look from the point of view of using the T-wave probes. Uh, these are the, the data from the T-waves down here. Now, one thing to be clear, the T-wave probes are uh, probes um, from Dominion uh, Microprobe, that, that uh, form factor cell. These probes, um, I really, really like them, and I would... Personally, use them pretty much for everything high frequency, with one caveat, which is when you measure an aluminium, the series resistance is uh, is worse, um, and that may be a problem for for your measurements. So, Infinity certainly still does have a place at the uh, millimeter wave uh, for those applications, uh, but it comes at a, a price in terms of uh, the losses that you get. But we'll make that very clear in the data that you see here. So um, here is a <coughs> conventional banded approach. Um, so this is what we used to sell, you know, in the past all the time. Um, we have setups where they're thermal, and we we have these uh, waveguide extension pieces here. And just to be clear, at low frequency, it's not an issue. Not really. The the improvements that you would get by losing that loss are comparatively minor, but much much more prevalent at uh, high frequencies. You know, WR threes, WR fives. Uh, and so on. Um, so, but in an ideal world, we we would be able to do away with this. It's nice to not have that uh, extra section of S-band, if anything, just for the cost of it. Um, 
So here's um, so, uh, one of our direct collect solutions. This is what we use uh, whenever we do um, 1.1 terahertz. We really want that to be direct connected if possible. Here it is, we've got uh, with WR2, so 500 gigahertz. And we do this by a raised chuck, but there are, you know, there's a price to pay for that. One of them is that you you don't have the ability to do uh, over temperature work, or not not readily anyway, of having a thermal chuck raising the air. Um, and the other limitation you have is you have a limited travel range. So um, the actual uh, probes do protrude below the underside of the extender, uh, but it will obviously limit the point that the chuck hits the side of the um, uh, the large area positioner. So there are some compromises to be made for that. Here's a nice solution that we have on the Summit 12K. Um, so on the 12K, um, what we do is we actually use uh, T, uh, T geometry probes. These are tool probes, um, and those tool probes are... Um, directly mounted to the frequency extenders. This We can only do this using the uh, mini modules from Virginia Diode, so this properly exploits the fact that you've got this smaller form factor uh, frequency extender. And it only works in the Summit 12K because of the uh, the reduced drop. Um, our other stations, like the you know the CM300s, the Elites, the Summit 200s, um, they have a deeper they have a deeper drop, and they do this for reasons of uh, thermal management to improve the uh, thermal performance at the platen. Uh, it is you know it's a, it is a it is a trade off, but we we take advantage of of this approach uh, on the Summit 12K uh, by having a, you know a shallow shallow 14 millimeters uh, for that. And you can see we're doing this using a motorized positioner and it's, you know, we're fully, you know, using the micro chamber and everything. So we can do full over temperature measurements with a direct connect probe. Now, this is the uh, new development that we have done in the, the last uh, what was a year or so ago now. Um, this is using the same concept, essentially, as we have uh, for the N5291A with the uh, inclined uh, extenders, uh, but this time we're using the BDI minis. Um, and as you can see, we're fully enclosed, we're you know, ready to cal, but we're really close uh, to our probe tips. No long wave guides or, or anything like that. We have uh, um, also a modular approach by which we can remove the entire arm by a single screw. Uh, and then slot on uh, another one, so you can leave a whole setup together, and then you know drop a drop another uh, arm straight on there, ready to go. The planarization is for the whole tilt plate, so the uh, the entire assembly will be adjusted by these micrometers controls. Um, so we do this by uh, we do make a small compromise. So we do have a, a very short section of waveguide on the this is the open architecture one where we're not inside the top hat, the right hand one. It's a very short section of waveguide, uh, but uh, it. Uh, when we, and to also to be clear, we're using the S geometry, the smaller, uh, less lossy uh, probes uh, for for this work. Just to be clear, um, the the one you see on the left, where we have, uh, in fact, uh, possibly the one on the right, the um, the actual le the length of these is less than that of the T geometry probe uh, with these waveguide extensions. And we, you know, we support all the normal S geometry probe types. So uh, we did a uh, an interesting experiment with this. We wanted to prove uh, the advantages that we see. So you can see on our left hand setup, we have conventional arrangement. We have um, same type of head um, from uh, Virginia diodes, Virginia diodes mini modules, and we're keeping the same module on each side. Uh, but we're, we're swapping over. We've got a um, large area positioner uh, on the left hand side, and we've got the you know advanced setup on the right hand side. You'll note we've got a motorized positioner on there. We do a cal and we let it drift. Uh, we take a measurement of the environmental temperature as it drifts, and we have basically the two setups with a with a, a side swap uh, to it, and we want to know which which drifts less. So. Um, we can see, uh, and that's that's those are the uh, those are the measurements uh, that that we did. If I look here, um, this is the give you an idea of the directivity that you would get. So we have uh, we did a short measurement, did a load measurement, and we normalized the load with the short. And as you can see in the conventional, you know, longer waveguide setup, uh, we have an occasion where the load actually is more reflective than the short. And we, you know, see a good margin between those two 
uh, all the way, all throughout the band, uh, when we have the you know the more advanced approach. And this gives you some uh, results uh, from this work. So this is basically all the measurements we did overlaid over one another, uh, and you can see you know the the max case of what was the worst case scenario and the worst case scenario uh when you had you, you know you had your uh advance you had your conventional on the left and you had your advance on the right and you can see this huge difference between the two likewise you swap them round you can see the characteristics uh swap uh with the head swap not not 100% but it's you know it is hugely indicative of the improved performance that you get we we expected it but it's lovely to have a confirmation of it. So welcome to the uh, second practical example. Uh, this is using WinCollect C and Python to extract uh, marker information uh, from uh, our drift data that we took. It's very useful to look at uh, drift at a particular frequency or worst drift uh, as it allows us to look at the over temperature and over time characteristics uh, of the drift and gain a bit more insight. So uh, let's come out of here. And uh, so we've got this time we're not using uh, we're not using the scripting console in Velux. We're in fact using Spider, which is part of the Anaconda uh, suite. Um, we have already installed the WinCal remoting for WinCal, and we've also installed in here uh, something that's called .NET. Uh, .NET is a, a mechanism by which we can talk to WinCal. I did that, you know, using command prompt. So I did, you know, pip install pip install dot net and it's it's already installed so it works but that's how you would install it yourself A similar process has gone through for uh if you wanted to control velux from remote python but in that case you would be pointing to um the velux.tar.gz which is part of the velux installation file Okay, so uh, that's all. That's all in there. Um, basically, I've got uh, a WinCal report here with 780 minutes worth of drift data. Um, in this case, uh, this was for, with the advanced setup on port two and the uh, long wave guide setup on port one. Um, essentially, we done a cal, uh, basically done a measurement. And then we do subsequent open measurements and we look at the difference uh, but between the first measurement and the nth measurement. And how do we do this? Well, we, we, we got um, on here, you'll notice there's only a single uh, there's only a single trace showing on here. And the reason why we're doing that is deliberate. We, because we're going to be using uh, some new custom markers, which are added in WinCal 4.9, which I'm very excited about because they uh, allow you to do lots of tricks. Um, so if you look at this marker, um, you'll see that the marker is basically got this name, percent delta max P1. But because I've got this, 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 ticked here it says show marker value as data items that sticks in uh, basically a live data item in the data item list of WinCal which will be you know whatever value this is in terms of location I've got this set to the max value though I could set it to you know a specific uh, value uh, of you know I could put it to a specific index and that's what I've done for the uh, the other uh, data um, but I'm going to put it to the max value for, for here we do the same for the for the other one, but this can only refer to a single trace. So what we do is we do the same trick as before. We have a um, we have a basically a string data item up here. Uh, if you do there, you can see my text box. It's called selector, and inside here we basically it's really simple. All we do is say take the value of selector, con 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 concatenate the selector. Uh, with uh, dot star, so and then we take as our input to um, our variable uh, is going to be basically it's a it's a variable string is going to do our selection and our select basically it's selector dot star which will mean whatever is in here and then anything else after it would be would be matching. 
and then we take that data item and we save that to a new data item called output and it's that output that we're looking at here. So effectively what we're doing is we're taking one of these data items and selecting it to be displayed here. And here, what we're doing is we're doing um, a percent difference and we're using the zero minute value uh, as, our, as our base uh, for that. So what it means, I can, it's, again, it's dynamic, so I can type in a value here and you see that these are dynamically changing. And those values, if you look on here, are reflected by these values down here. And the really nice thing is, uh, yeah, you can see that's output too. Um, and the really nice thing is, is that, well, as I have those, I can now query those things uh, inside Python. So if I, um, let me just save this thing. I'll close it down because it needs to physically open it. So let's uh, let's uh, make this a little bit larger so we can see a bit more what's going on. Uh, so inside here we've done our you know basically we're referencing .NET .NET seamless. Um, we are establishing the communications with WinCal here. We our base path is pointing to uh, our demonstration directory. And uh, we basically are going to open that report that we were just playing with a minute ago called drift.wrp. We're going to grab the current time and then we're going to basically create a new directory based on the current time to store the data in. And uh, we're going to open an output file. We're going to output a CSV for our, our drift data. And uh, we're going to, our item list is all the things that we want to collect up from our Winkar report. Now we only had two of them, but it's this uh, is designed to be generic. So you can have however many you want in there. I'm going to, I'm going to start my collection from five minutes onwards up to 785 minutes. And I'm going to step in five minute intervals. I'm going to create a list of X's and I'm going to create basically a list of lists for Y. In this case, my list of lists ha is a list of two lists, which is uh, basically this guy, this guy, so which is why I'm creating it for the length of item list. I have some color assignments as a list of colors and uh, I basically I'm saying show time is so I'm basically saying my current time is equal to this and then uh, I am uh, loading uh, my report so that's the report so that that was I created the name for the report up here and then I'm, and I'm opening it down here um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go around and I'm going to go from start time to the end time uh, I'm going to into my X list I'm going to append the current X value the current uh, time value and I'm going to send that value out. So that's going to go into uh, our um, this selector. We're going to point it into that selector value that we had in that report. Have a little bit of a delay. So let it process. And then uh, we're going to go uh, round in the range of items lists, which is only two items, but it could be anything. And we're going to uh, grab the complex data item which is the effectively that uh, that marker for is the item which is created as a complex data item. We're going to import that into Python, and then we're going to look at uh, basically it's only going to be the real part of that. It's it's going to have a value because it's uh, it's just a magnitude. Uh, so we're going to look at the real part of that, which is uh, position zero, and uh, basically we're going to append that value to our Y list in the basically the nth position. So we'll have two positions, zero and one in our Y list. So we've got two lists, basically one which is the port one uh, error delta, should I say, and one which is the port two delta. So that's basically Y list zero, Y list one, and we'll append to that. We'll just basically print the current value that we've just measured out and that will that will iterate away till it's finished. And then at the end, um, it will set up um, basically the graph characteristics uh, and then we will basically uh, we will output that data that we've that we got into a into a list that we can see which will also be written uh, to a file you can see that happening there and uh, then uh, we will um, 
then we will do our basically our plot. So it will be you can see this is this is uh, looping. So we're looping for uh, position of range of items list. So it's got two positions. So effectively we get two basically two uh, lines plotted on there, which will be um, y list zero, y list one. And then we will, and then your the color will correspond to the position in its color list as well. So it's saying port one will be red, port two will be blue. And yeah, that will that should uh, output nice graph to us, and we'll show it, and then we'll close our output file, and then we'll hopefully have some data. Uh, I'm going to speed this up because it will it will run pretty slowly. But uh, let me maybe make this a bit smaller for now because WinCal is going to pop up. So let me run this. So we can see it's doing its thing. So here you see the output data uh, from the uh, script run. And here is the uh, CSV data, uh, which we also measured, ready to have the temperature data added to it. So um, Looking a little bit uh, more deeper into some of the uh, approaches we, we we showed in that example, we actually took the the data that that was that was derived from measurements like that. In fact, I did it in a different way uh, using the scratch pad beforehand. So whereas that was the max drift, this is the uh, drift at a what what is visually the the max drift at one particular frequency, so it doesn't jump around. But because uh, my previous technique didn't allow that. Um, but we look at we can see here um the drift characteristics of the basically the conventional setup in blue and the advanced setup in red and we can also overlay of temperature and you can see this really nice uh, correlation uh, between temperature and drift of both the extenders uh but you can see the clear improvement of using uh the you know the reduced length path length setup just putting it uh, into perspective, if we drill into the data some more, um, if we were taking a, a view that we wanted to, you know, our, we wanted to take measurements that were better than 0.2 dB normalized, um, if we look at the, you know, the red trace, we can see that's exceeding it sort of about 80, 90 minutes. But if we look at the blue trace, it's exceeding it in what, four minutes? So it's, uh, it's uh, kind of a night and day comparison from that perspective. Likewise, uh, on manual stations, we also, you know, have this, you know, two two tier approach. So we have a ability to, you know, have waveguides, but we also can have direct connect setup. So this is direct connect setup. Uh, the race chuck is very easy to do on the manual stations, uh, and in fact, actually, doesn't make too much of a compromise in terms of maximum uh, travel range. So we can get to the whole the whole wafer surface. So this is a, a really pretty good approach. Um, <clears throat> So we, as I say, we've got correct direct connect uh, S geometry probes for this work, and we can also use the same approach uh, with the large uh, VDI extenders, as long as the extender doesn't have an attenuator. If it has an attenuator, then we then we have some problems. This is just to show you the same kind of setup, um, but with large area positions instead of the uh, what we call the forklift version. This large area position has the advantage that we can have the motorized east, and that motorized east allows us to do uh, multi-line TRL semi-automatic, semi being we, we have to move the stage manually by hand. This little video just shows you something else we've been using, which is a differential displacement gauge. This, the reason why we use a differential gauge um, is because um, if you can imagine if you're just looking at the, the position the position is in uh, and you did it for any length of time, then you do have 
you know, obviously the, the extenders do ex expand. So over a short period of time, this isn't so much an issue at all. Uh, but on a longer period of time, this, this is more of a concern. Um, it also, you know, allows you to get absolutely to where the action is. And it was a very convenient setup for, for what we were trying to do. Uh, this is using also a very high-end gauge. So it's uh, to win, uh, it has a 0.1 micron uh, uh, resolution to it and this is just to give you a nice little example to show you well both how nice the motorized positions were but also um, the use of the gauge uh, essentially it's all been set up in advance and uh, we have you know the gauge is pretty much zeroed out and we go to the Velux setup, Velux, Velux controlling the motorized positioner on a manual station and we're going to do an offset of a mi of a one millimeter And then we're going to go over and look at that. It's moved one millimeter. Now we're going to move another millimeter. Oh look, it's two millimeters and 0.6 microns. Now let's go back to where we came from, go back to home. And we're back to being a tenth of a tenth of a micron. It's uh. It's pretty good. I was very pleased with that. Um, <clears throat> so with regard to you know tools which will help you out accuracy wise, you saw earlier the accuracy improvements. Uh, you know basically when you're trying to measure long transmission lines, but it's exactly the same approach we do for calibration purposes. So certainly if you don't have autonomous, this is a really good way to to go because you can really precisely align your probes up. And I I always align my probes up using the markers to make sure I get things in a consistent manner. Particularly if I'm using you know optical uh, uh, optical feedback of of the marks I made. Uh, we can set these up inside um, uh, Spectrum, but we also have I prefer these days to do this uh, via script entry. One thing I can't stress enough uh, with regard to trying to improve your setup is, you know, air conditioning. Think about it. Think about where the air, the vents are, and take action if you have it. If you unfortunately have a vent near your measurement setup, try to do anything you can to divert it away from the the instrument, as it has a a very marked effect on on your measurement stability. Likewise, sunlight. Uh, may avoid any sunlight hitting the hitting the VNA or the extenders, as this can have a a pretty marked effect on drift. Uh, I always tend to have a you know a, a logger going to understand what the thermal characteristics of the room are, and so if something changes, I can see if you know if data is going haywire, I can have some data to uh, to tie this to. Here was an example, a real life example. I was doing some of that performance measurements that you saw me doing before, and I was having a tough time of it. And I noticed my repeatability was terrible. I wondered why, and then I thought. I feel a bit cold. And I looked up and realized there's a vent above my head. It was pretty stupid of me. Um, <clears throat> so you can see this big oscillation that we were getting as the aircon kicked in and out. Um, we then took action. We then put some vents in, and you can see how the temperature of the room stabilized nicely. Uh, you can see this with the... Uh, so this is the error set uh, comparisons, and you can see the error set deltas, you know, cal on cal, massively improved. Uh, from having the, the vents in there. So highly, highly recommended. And this is only WR10, right? Only WR10. Um, so another thing to improve is to, you know, we, we, we provide ISSs for 1.1 terahertz, right? Uh, and for, you know, other, other frequencies for uh, multi-line TRL use. Ultimately, we kind of expect customers to have their multi-line TRL standards uh, on the way for itself. Um, that gives you the best benefit and allows you to have the reference plane, um, but basically at the at your device, um, so you can remove the launch characteristics. But we do provide these ISSs; they are a very useful thing to understand your system. You can also move the reference plane back to the probe tip and do you know conventional probe tip cows, but you then you know subject to the normal parasitic issues you you have on the wafer. Um, but one thing that was particularly useful and a particularly nice feature of this design, uh, I think, is the fact that each and every single standard on the ISS has some alignment markers directly above it. What that means you can is that even on a manual station, you can learn your probes up with these markers and then purely make a wide translation downwards, which is so easy to do. 
with very, very little chance of any Z offset causing uh, additional over travel that you don't expect. Um, and you, I just find it the best way to get really spot on positioning for this 1.1 terahertz work. Okay, so one thing that we did do, uh, we looked into the you know 1.1 terahertz. We wanted to know how much benefit there would be of you know three things. One, fully automatic station, bells and whistles, uh, motorized position and motorized stage. We had another one. We had a manual station, motorized, uh, manual station, motorized positioner, and then the third scenario is a fully manual setup. Here's the one I get to share off a little bit. Uh, this was kind of a fun thing, a sped up video that shows you the fully automatic multi-line TRL cal. Essentially, the machine just whips through and does its thing. All the, all the cal measurements and all the probe movements are done. Fully handled all of that position. The same one, incidentally, that was giving me that uh, those positions to 0.1 microns. You'll note that we have a ton of lines in here. We do that to provide us with a nice flat propagation constant. So in those measurements, what we did is, again, we did the sort of standard repeatability stuff. We, we measure a standard and we compare a family of those and we see how, how repeatable that is. So we do the cal. We were recorrecting one of the lines used in the, in the cal itself, which is line six, and uh, just observing uh, the changes. Now, to, to the naked eye, you can see a little bit, even with the naked eye, just, just looking at those. But here, we're looking at the... Um, percent delta sorry and sorry I apologize not percent delta this is in this uh, one we're looking at the uh, phase and magnitude and you can see uh, that we we basically get our best measurements as you would hopefully expect for the fully automatic um, very good with the motorized manual uh, but we basically again similar with the um, the full manual except that we have this outlier. So, you know, in general, you can do fantastic measurements fully manual, especially when you've got markers above every standard. This may have been a totally different story if I hadn't had those markers. Um, the only trouble is, is I probably made some sort of small, silly mistake. You'll tend to get a bit more vibration on the station when you're moving positioners around. Um, so it could be down to that. So in my, my general view of it was, you know, it's not essential to have the motorized position, but it isn't a great help and it's much less chance of making um, some silly mistake. Uh, and as you can see, this is, you can see the effect of these by these percent deltas. But for the most case, um, you know, most of the measurements were quite consistent in the, in the, in the fully manual case, but it's just those outliers are so much easier to get. I, I had to try really hard to get a good family of the manual measurements. So, semi or the fully auto i just set it up and ran it and it was fine it was a bit of a struggle with with the manual uh setup so uh when we go when we ch change the temperature of the machine uh one thing that we notice is that the the probes move the chuck moves everything moves that's a bit of a problem when we need to very precisely uh know the reference plane of our probe tips it's also a problem when you want to make constant contact on your on your devices and again know the reference plane for your device measurements um this little video gives you an example of um <clears throat> how much the probes grow this is a um, uh, basically a measurement I did I had a, I had the probe set up at uh, 25c I increased the temperature to 125 I let the thing drift and the probes grew outwards and then I took it back down again and so you can see them retract let me just do that one more time so you can see you know these were I I think uh, there might be 50 micron probes, but there was a, a really considerable movement uh, on those. And these weren't even close to touching the, the wafer, so their temperature would, would get considerably warmer and they would go even more if they were closer. Another thing to consider with thermal measurements is um, certainly when you're reaching the edge of the chuck, 
you'll find uh, one probe will get hot, the other one will cool down. So you will see a noticeable uh, offset between the two, um, particularly so when you go to the ISS. So you really want to do any ISS stuff as, as quickly. This little video is just showing you uh, one setup that we did. We had the probes. It was stabilized at the wafer. I went over to the ISS and I did pattern recognition and, and did some measurements, but I, I watched the probes move. So if you watch them, you can see them just gradually shrink backwards. Each one of those little pauses is when we're just doing an open measurement. And you can see that left hand one is not hardly moving at all, but it's moving masses on the right hand side. I think you get the general gist. Um, <clears throat> and you can see this reflected by the you know, mechanical movements that we picked up. This is from pattern recognition. So they're like sub five microns seemingly in X, Y, Z for the, sorry, X, Y for um, both probe one and two. It's just that X axis on uh, probe two that really pulls backwards as you can see. And in this case, port one has the thermal chuck really close to it, keeps it warm. Port two doesn't over the ISS. Um, this graph here is showing you, uh, so if you remember that measurement I did at to 50 gigahertz, uh, I had uh, a calibrate, calibration was done at ambient, and then we increased the temperature of the probes, and then you can see the, you know, the characteristics change. So how do I, how do I improve things? Well, you know, typically, what you want to think about is you want to minimize that time away from the, the, the wafer chuck. Uh, one way of doing that is um, essentially to uh, set your number of points, you know, as low as you can bear. Unless you need a thousand points, don't use a thousand points. Unless you need a low IF bandwidth to get things because you've got very low power levels, don't use a low IF, low IF bandwidth. You'll find that instruments like the N5291A are extremely good uh, at handling low power with comparatively high IF bandwidth. I've had setups that have been set to 10 kilohertz and have been getting me good repeatable results. Um, obviously, the higher frequency you go, the worse that is. But, you know, if you can speed things up, do what you can to speed things up. In an ideal world, it'd be lovely to have that done in less than a minute. Often that never happens. You know, unless you have autonomous, you do have a tough time with this. So help yourself out. Use on-screen markers to get probes as perfectly aligned as they can be. So you don't have to adjust them at the ISS. You don't want to spend any time doing that. You want them to be pre-positioned. In fact, I went to the limit here, the level here of pre-positioning my probes on a, a separate ISS as an experiment. And that made a, a decent improvement. Obviously, you can't do that normally with a wafer. One thing you could do if you wanted to be dramatic about it is you could actually do the cal on the hot chuck. So that, you know, we always just say don't do that. And the reason is because the resistors will change. But you can measure those resistors. You can use, you do it automatically. And Winco has uh, linkages so you could enter that uh, values directly. But these all are pretty tricky things uh, to do. Um, one thing just to set some expectations. This was from some of the, you know, FMP work we did. Just bear in mind, you will see a bigger range of error set variation uh, from ambient as opposed to thermal. You just will, even if you do everything perfectly, there will be a bigger range. We'd love it wasn't the case, but it, it just is. You will see uh, a bigger range. Um, so with all these hardships, um, let's introduce something that hopefully makes things a lot better. We spent a long time uh, developing this uh, for the need of over temperature work. It's not only for over temperature, but it was a significant driver of that. Um, with autonomous RF, um, essentially, we got a system which will do a full cal for you. Um, you don't need to even place those probes ever on the ISS. All of that is handled fully automatically, including all the probe positioning, making sure everything's centered, the dimensions, everything that's handled fully automatically. Um, Calibration drift, whereas previously you'd have to send separate commands to WinCal to query it, that's handled automatically. It has some rules which determine when it looks based on however die steps or subsite steps or time. It will do a monitor if it might fails a monitor, auto cal. Um, 
it has full thermal management, so it deals with all the soaks. Um, and all this will help you save your time. You're not going to spend as much time thinking about calibrations. You just set the thing running. I have Machina run it almost all the time in Oregon. I run it remotely from the UK. I don't even think about it because I can set it up. The only thing I need to do is planarize probes, which I can't do myself, and uh, load wafers. But everything else I can handle remote. Um, and you also can deal with the fact that your system will be changing uh, as a function of temperature. The system handles stabilization, so it look, looks to make sure the S parameters are stabilizing. Um, as it cows, it's going to move the DC probes out of the way. It's going to uh, move to the ISS calibration substrate for you, or clean it. Um, it will align the ISS, do the full cal, and move everything back again at the end. This is all made possible by the use of uh, our new um, RPP 504 positioner. Um, we've sold a bunch of these, not just for this application, but also on uh, photonics setups too. Here's a nice example that shows you um, essentially some of the benefits of autonomous RF. So if you look at the blue line on the bottom, this was a series of measurements. Now, this was never allowed really to stabilize as well as we'd like. So uh, the cows are pretty frequent or the checks are pretty frequent. And essentially, the orange line is uh, uh, we did one cow and then we, we it's in fact the same set of data we used for these, but we just uncorrected it uh, and then we uh, then use the, the initial correction for all measurements. Um, this on the bottom, however, is when it's recalibrated every time. So you can see, you know, it's holding. These are measurements of the transmission line on our special measurement substrates, so measurement wafers, and we're keeping in the, you know, this is at one two five. We're keeping EVM variation down below the four percent mark. It's going up to twelve percent unless we recalibrate it. So you can see big improvements there. One other thing autonomous deals for you that you might not think about is uh, deals with multiple device and the test geometries. So it's not unusual to have different uh, lengths of line or different transistor lengths and things like that. And so this will automatically move to those uh, in your test suite as long as you have defined those things. Here's just a little uh, video showing the system. It will just make an automatic uh, move. And that's just because I it's going to this subsite here and it's looking up the location it's going to go to from this label. And then it'll just handle that all automatically. <coughs> uh, one other thing to talk about is um, autonomous is basically there obviously to improve your accuracy and everything, but it's also a labor saving device. So you don't have to spend your time going over the station over and over again, realigning probes or anything like that. But it also lets you save actual machine time, whereas it, where normally it would be uh, having to soak um, because you're worried about the probes moving. Um, now we basically don't have to have such long soak times um, as long as your device time on the device is short. If you're spending a long time on the device, then you still have to soak as much as before because the we can't do anything about the probe geometry changing at uh, in contact with the dot. But uh, as long as it's not spending a long time on the dot, it can adjust every time. It can recalibrate as needed and you can leave it to do that. Um, the, the actual integration side of things uh, for you know, the customer integrating in their code is comparatively straightforward. Essentially, we have this single command. It does everything. Essentially, it uh, changes the temperature. As it changes the temperature, it maintains the probe geometry. It will do all the die soaks for you. It will do the cleaning for you. It does the check on the VNA to make sure everything's stable. Puts bias probes out the way. It will you know, do the cal for you, verification, take monitoring data, and return the probes to the wafer geometry. All you need to do during this whole time is you'll need to query the status. So you would send this command and wait till it says, yeah, I'm done. And when it's done, you start continuing with your testing. Here's a little uh, video of uh, a thermal transition. Note this temperature up here. So it's sort of starting off at minus 50. So the system is being told to go up to 125. And all the time it's monitoring that probe to probe spacing. We're not having to get probes close to the way for anything like that. It's handling that, all that stuff itself. We're at 125 and so now the uh, time starts slowing down. It doesn't spend quite so long doing things.
And eventually, once it decides everything's stabilized, eventually, <laughs> You can see these, this contact height varying. That will start calming down when everything's stable, down to two micron va variations since the last cycle. And the system will say, okay, it's time to clean. Then it's time to align my probes on the ISS. And you'll see it's actually finding those probes. It's dynamically finding the tip of the probe. Warming the probes back up again. That's going to auto cal. Warms things up again. And once it thinks everything's all warm, it will do a validation measurement. If it declares that's good, gets all the geometry back to how it should be before and off to the duck. One last point. Um, we spent a lot of effort uh, getting uh, the autonomous RF, but we needed a lot of effort also to make uh, tests to make sure that it was all stable and everything and doing what we intended to do. So one of me, my colleagues developed this wonderful piece of software called Performance Monitor, uh, sorry, Performance Analyzer. Um, Performance Analyzer uh, basically is um, uh, is running in MATLAB, and it can do a number of trips with regard to the statistics of the machine. So it looks at uh, EVM values, measurements of these uh, transmission lines on the wafer, uh, and it also looks at does mechanical analysis. So it looks at the marks it's made and gives you some uh, feedback on where the probes are, and so you can get some metrics on where the probe geometry is and the cows and everything. We use this at customer sites to make sure everything is all set up nicely. So hopefully this uh, presentation was useful and gives you some idea of uh, some of our recent improvements. All the best and uh, keep safe. Thanks. Bye-bye.